All right, good morning, church. We're going to go ahead and get started this morning. If you're happy to be in the house of the Lord, say amen. 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 Well, Brother Greg is, is not here today, so you're stuck with me. Uh, we'll make the best of it. But let's go ahead and stand at this time. I'm uh, going to sing a couple songs, and we'll have Brother Ben come up and, and do announcements. But let's start off with Do, Lord. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun way beyond the blue. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Way beyond the blue I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too While he's calling you Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me Lord, oh, do Lord, oh, do remember me. Do Lord, oh, do Lord, oh, do remember me. Way beyond the blue. Do Lord, oh, do Lord, oh, do remember me. Do Lord, oh, do Lord, oh, do remember me. Do Lord, oh, do Lord, oh, do remember me. Way beyond the blue. Do in Christ alone. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ. I stand in Christ alone who took on flesh fullness of God in helpless faith this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his 
his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand amen you may be seated This morning, you should be able to find a bulletin there in your pews. Just remind you of a few announcements. We've started back Children's Church this morning is the uh, the first morning, so that meets uh, in the upstairs above the old fellowship hall. And uh, Miss Heidi is taking care of that today. And of course, it's for uh, kids in uh, four years old up through uh, second grade. Uh, so I know many of you want to take advantage of that during the 11 o'clock uh, worship hour. We do need some more helpers for that. So we do that on a rotation basis. So if you'd be willing to help, you can see Miss Heidi. I think she put a sign-up sheet in the foyer. We, uh, we've only had a few people volunteer to do that. So we want to provide that service. And uh, it's a blessing to the kids. It's a blessing to those working with the kids. And a blessing to the parents all around. Uh, but we need a few more helpers with that. So if, uh, if you can help us out with that, we would greatly uh, I appreciate that, so remember that. Next Sunday after the morning service, going to have a security team meeting. You can see Brother Adam uh, if you've got any questions about that. Uh, we'll probably meet, he said, meet just down front in the sanctuary after the service is over. So that will be next Sunday. Again, you see uh, see Brother Adam, I think he's in the foyer right now. Keep an eye on things so you can see him if you've got any questions about that. Uh, notice the dates for uh, Kids Camp coming up in uh, September. On Wednesday night, we're doing a really good Bible study on the life of Jesus. Everybody is really enjoying that. So uh, we are having Wednesday night service. I think you'll enjoy that. And we, of course, have uh, uh, classes for the kids and uh, teenagers as well. Uh, we're glad you're here. We want to uh, go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, continue to worship and uh, sing unto the, uh, the Lord. Brother Coy, won't you lead us in a word of prayer, if you will, brother? All right. We want to stand and continue to sing praises unto the Lord. So you stand with me. Brother Matt, you and the uh, praise team come lead us, brother. Okay, guys, we're going to sing King of My Heart, one we've done several times before. The king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. Cause you are good. Let me down. Yo. 
never gonna let me down. No, you're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. No, you're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You are good. song we won't have a special this morning so after this song brother ben will come up and and bring the message we're going to sing glorify thy name and as we sing that again just begin to prepare your heart for uh, the message to come glorify thy name Uh, we're glad you're here with us in the Lord's house. We're going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians. There in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. And we're going to begin reading in verse number 17. First Corinthians chapter number 12. And verse number 17. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. We're going to read verses 17 and 18. I want us to think about this, this thought this morning. What does it mean to be the hands and feet of Jesus? What does it mean to be the hands and the feet of 
of Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 17, the Apostle Paul says, If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for this day you've given us, Lord. Thank you for each one who's came out. Father, the uh, the attendants this morning, we're thankful for each family. And Lord, as we look to the Word of God, I pray that uh, we would see the the truth of the Scriptures. It would encourage us. Uh, Lord, it would challenge us. Father, that we might, every one of us that are saved, that we uh, might truly here on earth be the hands and feet of the Lord. Now bless this time. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the hands and feet of Jesus. Very, very popular phrase. No doubt you've seen that. Uh, there are uh, people sharing quotes on social media. Many songs about this. I know Casting Crowns has a very popular song, If We Are uh, the Body. And, and even Audio Adrenaline, Matt, you were maybe thinking about it, has a great song, uh, Hands and Feet. You can watch that uh, video on YouTube. And they've got a great song about what does it mean? I want to be, be your hands. I want to be your feet. Being the hands and feet of Jesus. Is that a biblical statement? Is it a biblical idea? What does it mean to be God's hands and feet? We're going to look here right in in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and I want us to think about that today. If you're taking notes I'll give you four D's if you will. Four D's are the point. I want you to see number one there's a declaration. God declares that churches, uh, that you and I as, as members, as believers, as Christians, as members of New Testament churches, there's a declaration. We are the body of Christ. So there's a declaration. We are God's hands and feet. There's a declaration. Number two, I want you to see every one of us has a distinct part to play. Every one of us is a distinct part to play. Number three, the third D, there's a dramatic statement. Every one of us is important. We've got a distinct role, and then every person, uh, there's that dramatic statement we're going to see. None are feeble. We're going to see that this morning, a dramatic statement. And then last of all, the dividend. What's the purpose, the result, the product of all of this? So that's the four Ds, a uh, declaration, distinct, a dramatic statement and the dividend. What are we talking about? Well, notice there in verse 27. We're going to stay in 1 Corinthians 12. Notice the the declaration. There in the first phrase in verse 27, Paul says to that church at Corinth, ye are the body of Christ. You and I are God's body on earth. Where's Jesus at right now? Jesus has gone back to heaven. He died on the cross. He was buried. After three days later, he rose again. For 40 days, he walked among men. And then Jesus ascended and went back to heaven. Jesus is in heaven. The Bible says he's at the right hand of the throne of God. But on earth... Where is Jesus at? And I know that God's presence is everywhere through the Holy Spirit. But the Bible says here on earth, you and I as believers, you and I as as members of churches, we are the body of Christ. We are God's body here on earth. God works through men. Uh, We're God's body. Now, the reason people loved in songs and quotes and sermons to talk about God's, we're God's hands and feet, that's what we use the most. Some of you keep track of your steps and you try to hit 10,000 steps every day, maybe 15 or even 20 or 25,000 steps. We walk a lot and not nearly as much as they did in the first century. We use our hands all the time to eat, to pick things up, to open doors, uh, to drive. The hands and feet, they're the things we use the most. And God is telling us here in 1 Corinthians 12, we are the body of Christ. We are God's ears. We are God's eyes. We are God's hands. We are God's feet here on earth. God uses people. What a declaration. Now that's not to say God doesn't use the Word. He still uses the Word. The Word of God convicts people. The Word of God is powerful. God uses the Word. God uses the... The Holy Spirit is active. The Holy Spirit is active. But again, I I think of Miss Martha. Every time I think of this verse, a threefold cord is not easily broken. God uses the Spirit. God uses the Word. And He uses people. He uses all three. You and I as believers, we are God's hands and feet here 
on earth. And that's always given God's plan. God has always used people. I mean, when, when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, God could have just supernaturally picked them all up and dropped them off in the promised land. But God said, I'm going to use Moses. And I'm going to use Aaron. And I'm going to use Joshua. And I'm going to use Caleb. And God used people to get the Hebrews out of Egyptian slavery and bring them to the promised land. When God looked and here's this giant, this, this uh, evil, wicked, ungodly man, this Philistine who's mocking God and mocking the people of God. God could have sent a bolt of lightning from heaven and struck him right between the eyes. But what does God do? God used a young man, a young boy, David. And David was able to take the sling and the Stone and slay the giant. God's plan, God uses people. What a declaration. Ye are the body of Christ. You and I, as God's children, God uses all of us. We are God's hands and feet. Now, it's not that God needs us. If God needed anything, He wouldn't be God, would He? The fact that God is God, He doesn't need us, but it's what a privilege. What an awesome responsibility and honor. That God wants to use you and I. We are the body of Christ. God is in heaven. Jesus is in heaven at the right end of the throne of the Father. But right now here on earth, you and I, if you're saved, you're his hands. You're his feet. You're the body of Christ here on earth. We see that amazing uh, statement, that declaration. But as you think through this chapter, and there's so much, we're just going to look at a few of the high points. There's not only that declaration, but then in verse 17... I read, you notice the distinct role. Notice verse 17. I know it's a a little hard to read, sometimes hard to grasp with the King James. But he says, if the whole body were an eye, if everybody was an eye, we're the body, we're the hands of feet. But if everybody was just an eye, where were the hearing? How would you be able to hear? If everybody was hearing, how would you be able to smell? What's he saying? Every one of us are distinct. Every one of us have a certain part to play. We're not all noses. We're not all eyes. We're not all ears. Everybody, every one of us that are saved has a distinct part to play. We're all important. We're all unique. Again, we're not all the same. We're different. Some are ears. Some are eyes. Some are noses. Some are hands. Some are feet. We're all unique. But God uses us all. We've all got a distinct part to play. And if you don't do what God wants you to do, if you don't fulfill that part, if, if we're all eyes and the person that's supposed to be an ear doesn't function as an ear, how are you going to be able to hear? We've all got a part to play. We've all got a distinct part. Now here's the danger. And this happened to me. I remember when, when I first came to West Kentucky and, and even before when I, was, I went to Campbellsville for a semester, when I, when I got to college, man, it was such a, a great time. I was in church all the time. And when I came down here to Mayfield, there was a great group of us. I mean, it was really a revival at Mid-Continent. And there were uh, so many of us the same age and many are still pastoring the area, some in other places. And we were in class and in chapel. And then on Sundays, we'd go to church and many of us would go over to Trace Creek. And we'd go uh, to, to 10 o'clock and Brother Charlie Bunton would teach the Sunday school hour. He's passed away and gone to be with the Lord. And Brother Charlie would just made doctrine come alive. And, and there would be great worship. Of course, Brother Ronnie Sr. would always bring the Word of God and preach a message. And, and man, there was, sometimes there'd be 20 of us from mid-continent sitting in those pews. And, and we were all growing. We were there. And, and man, the Lord was working our lives. But I got to thinking about it. We weren't really contributing anything. We showed up, we listened, we were blessed by the Sunday school hour, we, we were enjoyed the worship, we were built up by the preaching of the Word, but none of us had joined there. None of us were helping out there at that time. We just sort of came, and then we left. We were blessed by it, we were growing in God's grace, but we weren't contributing anything. And finally the Lord got a hold of me about that, and the Lord began to deal with some of us. All of us have got a part to play, and it's really easy to fall into that, where you come to church, and man, you're enjoying the singing, you're enjoying the teaching, you're enjoying the preaching, the fellowship, the ministries, the program, everything that the church has got to offer. It's helping you, it's blessing you, it's helping you to walk with God. But if you're not careful, you'll be taken and not given. 
And God wants us, we've all, again, everybody, we're all different, we're all distinct. But if you're an ear, you've got a part to play with hearing. If you're an eye, you've got a part to play with seeing. If you're a nose, you've got a part to play with smell. God says all of us have a distinct role to play. And when you do that part, we'll never be what God wants us to be until every person does their part. I like what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 6. In verse number 8, God said to Isaiah, Who shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Then said I, Here am I, send me. God blesses when all of us do our part. I like that in verse 17 where it says, If the whole body, the whole body, every one of us in the body have a part to play. And churches go forward. God blesses when each of us are fulfilling our distinct purpose. I mean, think about it. We see this picture in everything. All around us, we could use so many examples. You can have the best quarterback in the land. But Brother Levi, I'll tell you, and I told him I was going to mention him in the sermon. But Brother Levi, I'll tell you, if you ain't got a good offensive line, you're going to struggle. You can have the best center and rebounders in the land. Brother Roger, Blade and Break would tell us so. They were here. If you ain't got a good ball handler, the team's going to struggle. You got to have the whole team. It's the same way in the church. If there's just one or two that are doing their part, the church struggles. But when every one of us realize we've got a part to play, we don't all do the same thing. Some of We're all God's hands and feet. All of us have a part to play. And we all need to step up. Lord, you've called me. You've declared that here on earth, you've gone to heaven. You're going to use the word. You're going to use the spirit. But you're going to use people. God, I want to be your hands. I want to be your feet. Whatever that means, I realize I've got a distinct part to play. I don't do the same thing as the person sitting beside me, in front of me, behind me but I've got something to do something to contribute and we all come together and work together as a church we get the job done there's that distinct part to play now I know when you start talking about this sometimes people say well I'm not sure if that's talking about me and so drop down to verse 22 and here's where we see that dramatic statement notice it there in verse 22 Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble. You may have a footnote in your Bible beside that word feeble. It has the idea of those who are weak, those who are sick, those who don't seem like they've got much to contribute. Those members of the body, we're the body of Christ on earth. Those members of the body which seem to be more feeble, what's the Bible say us? Or necessary. That's why I called this point a dramatic statement. God says every one of us is important. Every one of us had his distinct part to play and none are feeble. None are weak. All are necessary. You see, here's what happens. When you start preaching in a church and you say everybody's got a part to play, none of us need to come to church and just sit there, hear the singing, hear the preaching, and that's all. Every one of us have a part to play. People start bringing up excuses, don't we? Well, well, preacher, uh, I'm too young. I, I'm not old enough to do anything in the church. But what did Paul tell Timothy? Let no man despise thy youth. That won't hold water. Well, well, preacher, I'm too old. Preacher, maybe I'm not too young, but, but I'm too old. I don't have the energy. I don't have the strength. I, I, I can't do the things that I used to do. And you may not have the health, the energy, or the strength to do the things you did years ago. But how old was Moses when he led the children of Israel out of Egypt? You remember the story. Moses fo- spent 40 years in Egypt learning to be somebody. He spent 40 years as a shepherd in the wilderness learning to be a nobody. And then he spent 40 years leading everybody. Moses was 80 years old when God said, Go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. 
We never retire from service, do we? We never reach a point where we say, you may retire from your job, you may retire from your hobbies, but you never retire from serving God. There's always something to do. Even I've seen people in the nursing home whose health is gone. They would wish they could come to church. They can't even get out of bed. But I've had them hold my hand and say, Brother Ben, every day, every Sunday morning while you're preaching, I'm praying for you. God leaves them here just to be a prayer warrior. We're never too young. We're never too old. Some people say, well, well, Brother Ben, I can't do anything. There's nothing I'm really good at. But that doesn't really hold water either, does it? Because every one of us are made in God's image. Every person, not just some people, not just part of people. Every human being is made in God's image. And God doesn't make any junk. Every one of us is good at something. Not everybody has the ability to sing, even though God calls us all to sing. Some people do a lot better than others. Not everybody has that ability to play an instrument like so many do such a great job in this church. Not everybody has the ability to do the same thing. But everybody is good at something. And whatever you're good at, who gave you that? Well, God gave you that ability. And what did God give it to you for? God gave it for, to you so you might use it some way, somehow for His glory. Sometimes people say, well, well Brother Ben, I... I've not been saved very long. But you notice all this chapter goes together. You back up and look there at verse number 7 in the chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7. Paul says the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Every Christian is given gifts. And talents. That's why I've never noticed this before. But you ought to underline this in verse number, uh, I read verse 22, where it says, Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem. You see that word right there in verse 22? Which seem to be the more feeble. Paul's saying they're really not feeble. They may think they are, but they just seem to be. Every one of us, doesn't matter how young, doesn't matter how old, doesn't matter if you think you're not good at anything, doesn't matter if uh, you think you've not been saved very long, every one of us, God declares, what a dramatic statement, every one of us are necessary in the work of the Lord. Sometimes people say, well, I, I don't know what to do. Just look around. Open your eyes. There's always something to do. We have talked about the need for children's church. And it's a need uh, in the church. And not everybody can do that. I know some of you don't have the patience. And you're not allowed to whoop kids that ain't your own. We encourage you to whoop your own. But you're not supposed to whoop kids that aren't your own. We don't do that. Uh, not everybody can do children's church, right? But many of you can. And what an opportunity for you to serve the Lord. To be God's hands and feet on earth. Some of you, Brother Adam's going to meet next week with us about security. Some of you, you can do that. There's a place for all of us. Sometimes people say, well, nobody's asked me. God has asked you. He said, you, if you're saved, you're my hands and feet. It's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. The preacher doesn't have to ask you. Somebody in the church doesn't have to go up to you and ask you. God has already asked you. God has said, if you're saved, there's a place. There's something for you in the Lord. We are the hands and feet of God. Now what happens? We come together and we do what God wants us to do. We come together as bodies of Christ, as God's body here at Farmington. And we come together and, man, we're doing what God... What's the result? What's the dividend, the, result, the product? Again, there's so much here, but look down in verse 25, what he says. He said that... In verse 25, that there should be no schism. That word means division. That there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Man, the result, we're all carrying the load. We're all working together. There's unity in the church. People talk about how divided the world is. 
But the church shouldn't be divided. We're not all going to agree. We all come from different backgrounds, don't we? We don't all like the same things. I talk about that all the time. We've all got different hobbies, different characteristics. Some of us live in the country. Some of us live in town. Some of us grew up different places. Some of you didn't even grow up in Kentucky. I didn't grow up in Graves County. We're all different. But yet there's a unity. There's a, somebody said, a rope of sand that holds the church together. What is it? We're all saved. We all know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Every one of us, we love Jesus. Jesus changed our life. I'm not what I ought to be, but I thank God I'm not what I was. Jesus made a difference in my life. Every one of us can say that. We believe the Bible. We don't understand all about it. We may not agree on some of the finer details, but we believe that God's Word, it's the inspired, inerrant Word of God. There's a unity. We realize we've got a purpose. God leaves us here after He saves us to serve serve him there's a unity in the church and that unity leads he said the members should have the same care for another we love each other we realize as family members we let each other down sometimes but your family members let you let it we let let each other in our own families down but when your sibling, your mom or dad, your brothers, your sisters, your kids, your grandkids do something you don't like, you don't throw them out of the family, neither does God's family. In the church, man, there's a love. We have the same care. We're praying for each other. When somebody's going through a hard time, we reach out. If somebody needs some help, we help them. Man, when somebody messes up, we forgive them. There's the same love. There's the same care. There's a unity in the church. The world can't touch that. But Jesus brings unity. As the church comes together, we realize we're God's hands and feet. Man, there's a unity. There's that love. And then we're coming together to do ministry. We're not going to deal with every one, but I think it's interesting as you go through the end of the chapter. In verse 28 and 29, he talks about some of the gifts God gives. And, And we know that many of these are temporary gifts, gifts that cease, the next chapter tells us. But you notice these are all ministry gifts. Verse 28, God set some in the church. First, apostles. Secondarily, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. He goes on to list helps, governments, uh, workers. All of their, their ministry gifts where you do something for the Lord. We realize the dividend, we come together and we are God's hands and feet. Every one of us, there's something we can do. You know, somebody sent me the other day a, a thing on the uh, social media. And I've not seen this before. I'm sure some of you will, will recognize the name and maybe even recognize the story. But it was about a baseball player. I think he's, he's not playing now. He's retired. But a, a guy who was an all-star for the Reds, uh, Scooter uh, Jennett. And uh, this fellow, Scooter Jennett, played the second base for the Reds. You may remember, Brother Gary, I'm sure you do. He's one of only 17 players to hit four home runs in a game. That happened against the Cardinals, I think, in uh, 2018. But that's what I thought was interesting. Every one of us are God's hands and feet. This boy, Scooter, didn't grow up in a Christian home. 2013, he's rookie year, I believe he's playing for the Brewers. And a, a fellow teammate witnesses to him. And he gets saved. Didn't grow up in a Christian home. Becomes a Christian. What can he do? He's a good ball player, getting an all-star in 18. What can he do to be God's hands and feet? And I've never seen this, but somebody sent it to me. When he's on bat or on getting ready, you know, he's there on deck, getting ready to go up to, to bat. Oftentimes he would take his bat and draw in the dirt and make the symbol of a fish there in the dirt. Not say a word, just he's waiting, he's getting ready to go, go bad, he's on deck, but he'll just take that, that bat and draw the symbol of a fish. How many times through the years, I wonder, have people went up to him and said, why do you do that? What's that mean? People are asking him, people probably Googling, what's, what's the symbol of a fish mean? It's a symbol of Christianity. From the first century. As the church was being persecuted by the, the Romans, uh, they used that symbol to show they were, they were true followers of Jesus. It's become, you'll see it on license plates a lot of times. It's a symbol, again, of Christianity. One little thing that this fellow Scooter does to be the hands and feet to point people to Jesus. There's something every one of us can do. Sometimes we think big, but I like the quote in the bulletin by D.L. Moody. 
Oftentimes we're willing to do the big things, but we're often not willing to do the small things for the Lord. God may be calling you to preach. God may not be calling you to be a missionary. May not even be calling you to be a Sunday school teacher. But there's something. Every one of us that are saved, you are the hands and feet of Jesus. You've got a part to play for the Lord. Maybe something small, but you can point people to Jesus. You can make a difference in the lives of those in our community. But you know, before you can be the hands and feet of Jesus, you've got to know Jesus. You've got to be saved. So number one, the first thing, if you're saved, if you know, preacher, I know, I remember when Jesus changed my life, I know that I'm saved. All right. But if you're not sure, if there's never been that time in your life, first things first, how's a person saved? By faith in Jesus. By coming to that point where you realize, I know I'm a sinner, but I believe that Jesus is a Savior. And I want to be saved. Crying out to Jesus. Faith in Him. That's how a person is saved. So I'm going to pray in a second. We'll have our time of invitation. Most important, if you've never been saved, today can be that day where you look to Jesus in faith and cry out to Him. If you have been saved, man, get in a church. Jump in with both barrels. God has already asked you. You don't have to wait for somebody else. God has asked you. Find a place somewhere that you might serve Him, that you might be the hands and the feet of Jesus. Let's pray.